Well, we thank you so very much for coming. We're going to be studying the book of Philippians. The Word of God is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirits and joints and marrow. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. So the Word of God is going to be the major focus of our study. Uh, James Daniel helped me do a little video on the difference between a spring and a cistern. Uh, Paul wrote at least 13 books of the Bible, more inspired books than any other man. The book of Hebrews is an anonymous letter. Some people think he wrote that, but his Letters are basically divided into four different groups. The first letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, were probably written around A.D. 51, 52, and those are approximate dates. Then, in around A.D. 57 or 58, were his four great doctrinal letters. They were Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians. And then several years went by, and around A.D. 61 or 62 are his four prison letters. Philippians is one of them. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, all written from a Roman prison. I say prison. He was actually in his own hired house, but he was a prisoner and was 24 hours a day chained to a Roman soldier. The fourth group are called his pastoral letters, written around A.D. 67 or 68, and that's First and Second Timothy and Titus. I think we're going to just jump right in and start with the first chapter of the book of Philippians and the first verse. And as we study the letter, I will try and make some comments about the background of the letter that will help it perhaps be more understandable. Now, for the benefit of somebody who may be watching a video, the www.boismoton.com under English Books has a book called The Life and Epistles of Paul, which is a study about the letters of Paul the background of the letters, the chronology of the letters, together with a whole bunch of other information. So let's jump right into Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Anybody need a, a Bible? As I said, we're using, maybe I didn't say, we're using the 1973 New International Version. And the reason that we're using that is because the church here has purchased in quantity that particular version of the Bible. There is a more recent edition of the New International Version which is gender neutral and uh, I wouldn't want to use that particular version of the Bible. So Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus. Now I want to take this opportunity to tell you how Paul and Timothy came to be associated with one another. Here we have a map of the three missionary journeys of Paul and this some call a missionary journey and others don't but that was his journey to Rome as a prisoner now he did preach in particular on the island of Malta and when he got to Rome he spent two years in his own hired house preaching and teaching. But Paul was converted in Damascus and his assignment was to witness to governors and kings and to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But for approximately ten years he was not an apostle to the Gentiles. It, that we just really don't know a lot of what he did. He began in Damascus uh, preaching 
and then he w went to Arabia for three years, and then he went to Jerusalem, and they tried to kill him, and then he went to Tarsus, and he was at Tarsus for a number of years, and then a great revival broke out in Antioch of Syria, and there were in the church at Antioch five prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Lucius, Manian, Simeon, and Saul. The reason Saul was there was because Barnabas went over to Tarsus where Paul was born and got him and said, we got a revival here. And it was at that congregation the disciples were called Christians the first time. Acts 11 and verse 26. It was the first integrated congregations that had both Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. So while they ministered to the Lord and fasted and prayed, the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So as they went on the first missionary journey, they came down to the island of Cyprus, and for the first time, Paul began to exhibit his leadership gift. And there was a false prophet named Bar-Jesus or Elymas. And so Paul rebuked him to his face and blinded him, and from there on out, he was no longer known as Saul of Tarsus, but rather Paul, the apostle. And instead of Barnabas and Saul, <clears throat> Barnabas and Saul, as though Barnabas was the leader, now it was Paul and his company, or Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. So uh, God used uh, this godly man Barnabas to help Paul develop his leadership skills. And it's altogether possible that God can use you to help somebody else develop their skills and they in turn may help you develop the gift that God has given you. Well, they went on this first missionary journey to the hinterland of Asia and there's another Antioch, this is called Antioch of Pisidia, Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and uh, Paul and Barnabas were chased out of every town and they came down to Lystra, and initially they thought Paul and Barnabas were Greek gods, and then the Jews came down from Antioch and Iconium and convinced them that they ought to stone Paul, so they stoned him and left him for dead. Now, I may talk about this later, but I think this may have something to do with the thorn in the flesh which he later experienced. But there was a young man at Lystra by the name of Timothy. And I think this was the first time that he had exposure to the gospel. His father was a Greek. His mother and grandmother were Jews. And I think that when he saw the Apostle Paul stoned and left for dead, dragged outside the city, the young teenage boy began to weep profusely. And at that moment, the Apostle Paul was revived, came back from the dead, and he opened his eyes, and he saw Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul mentioned that he was mindful of Timothy's tears. And that may be what he was referring to. Well, on the next missionary journey, Paul comes through the area of Lystra, and according to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, he said, I, I want this young man Timothy to go with me. He had this desire. But also in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, the scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit pointed out Timothy to Paul. So I think we have a convergence of two things that caused Timothy to be an evangelist. One of them was the fact that Paul liked him and he liked Paul, but the other one was the Holy Spirit said, do it. And just as the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul, I think the Holy Spirit set apart Timothy for the work where they were called. Well, as they went through Asia, Paul wanted to preach in Asia, and the Holy Spirit said no. He wanted to preach in Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit said no. And... They came down to Alexandrian Troas over here on the Aegean Sea. And it was there they met uh, the beloved physician whose name was Luke. And uh, Luke was a Gentile. 
And uh, Paul may have gone there uh, to him as a doctor because Paul had a lot of infirmities. But at any rate, in the book of Acts, we have what are called the we sections. Luke, in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, they did this, they did this, they did this, and then we left Troas and went to Samothracia and Neapolis and Philippi. And so he was now Paul's traveling companion. And when Paul wrote to the Philippians in the second chapter, maybe I should again just read this verse so you get it directly from the Word of God. And I am confident, this is Philippians 2.24, I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. He's in prison now, but he thinks he's going to get out. And I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, uh, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. He was also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of me. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Uh, I really started in the wrong place. Forgive me for that. Let's go back to verse uh, 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. Now, we I got off on this introductory material because of verse 1. Paul and Timothy. Paul was in prison in Rome, and Timothy was there as his helper. Now, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So, they, they come, uh, a man of Macedonia appears in a vision to Paul when he is at Troas, and he says, come over into Macedonia and help us. So Luke and Timothy and Paul, perhaps others, go to Philippi. And you have to have, I think, what is it, 12 men in order to have a synagogue. And if you don't have 12 men, you can't have a synagogue. And so they had what they called the prosuke which was a place of prayer down by the riverside. A bunch of women were down there. And the most prominent woman there's name was anybody remember? Lydia. And she was from Thyatira over in Asia Minor. And uh, she was a seller of pur purple and probably a very wealthy woman. And the Lord opened her heart. She received the gospel and she and her whole household were baptized. Now, there are a number of household baptisms mentioned in the Bible. Later in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, we read that the Philippian jailer and his household were baptized. But I don't want to be offensive, but the Bible teaches believers' baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism by itself has no magical right or spiritual power. There's an old joke that was told about the preacher who was a little befuddled when someone brought a little baby for him to baptize. And he didn't want to be offensive to the parents, but he held the little baby up. The little baby's name was Tim. He said, Timmy? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Timmy didn't say anything. Timmy, did you hear me? Said, I said, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? He didn't say anything, and so he handed it back to his parents and said, I can't baptize Timothy. He refuses to confess his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course, in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts, uh, the King James Version talks about the Ethiopian eunuch. He said, here's water. Why does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip the evangelist said, If you believe, you may. If well, I believe. And uh, that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the so they stopped the chariot, went down into the water, he baptized him, and uh, came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. 
I think, uh, well, let me say a little bit more about the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, and um, I hope that those of you who are watching the video or that you as members of this class will read that passage at your own leisure. But there were three prominent conversions in that chapter of the Bible. The first was Lydia. She was a Jewish Jewish woman, and I think very wealthy, a seller, a businesswoman from miles away in Asia. Then there was a slave girl who had a demon that enabled her to tell the future. And the third convert was the Philippian jailer. Paul and uh, Silas were in the stocks at midnight. They had been unjustly beaten. And uh, they were singing hymns. I love that. They were singing. And there was an earthquake. And the doors of the jail were opened. And the jailer was about to commit suicide. And Paul said, do yourself no harm. We're here. We're all here. And he took him to his house. And they taught him the word of the Lord. And uh, he washed their stripes, and he and his whole family were baptized. But again, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so we may be certain that the members of his family were not infants, but they were people old enough to hear the gospel and believe the gospel, repent of their sins, and confess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the rulers of the city had Paul beaten, severely beaten, and never realized he was a Roman citizen. Philippi was a colony of Rome, and they were very, very proud of their Roman roots. And the fact that they had beaten a Roman citizen put them in very serious trouble with Roman government. And so uh, they told Paul he could leave, and Paul said, Nay, verily, you know, you've beaten me, and I'm a Roman citizen. If you want me out of town, you come in here and talk to me face to face. So they very humbly came down and talked to him, and Paul left Philippi, and there was a Roman road called Via Ignatia that went all the way from Rome to Constantinople, and Philippi a colony was right on this, and so they went from Philippi to Amphipolis to Apollonia and then to Thessalonica, and they stayed there three Sabbath days. And while they were teaching in the synagogue for three Sabbath days, after that they were driven out of town, there were two different offerings that came from the church at Philippi to Paul when he was in Thessalonica. He mentions that in Philippians, excuse me, Philippians chapter 4. Let me see if I can put my finger on the, the verses. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 14 and following. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I received a full payment and uh, so forth. Now... I'm speculating, but uh, I'm thinking that wealthy people are often very, very generous, and I think Lydia was that way. I may have told you before that I was giving flight instruction to a businessman here in Joplin, Missouri in the United States, and he owned a very fast and efficient airplane and he gave me the keys to the airplane so that I could teach his son to fly. It was a Mooney Mark 21 that would go around 170, 175 miles an hour and uh, so he told me, now boys, uh, anytime you 
need the airplane, it's the Lord's airplane. You just take it and use it. If you're using it for God, just take it and go. So one day I flew to Indiana for a meeting, and when I got back, I called him up and I said, Well, I want to thank you for using your airplane. It really saved me a lot of time. And he said, Boys, how many times do I have to tell you that's not my airplane? That's the Lord's airplane. And uh, if you need gas, just charge it to me, you know. Uh, it's, it's not mine, it's the Lord's. So here was Lydia, you opened her home, she said, if you judge me faithful, come and dwell in my house. And when Paul uh, was at Thessalonica, she had a motherly heart, and she was, I'm sure, concerned about him. And uh, she said, let's send some money. Just a couple of days trip down there. Here's here's some money. You take it. Tell him to to eat better. Uh, tell him to buy himself a, a warmer coat. Uh, at the risk of being inappropriate, I'm sure she's passed on now, but there was a lady in Bakersfield, California named Zelma Douglas. She was a widow and her husband had made a lot of money in oil. And they built a, a huge home on an acre of ground in Bakersfield. And uh, she spent almost all of her time in the garden and in a little shack out behind canning. And uh, she had a little house that she called the prophet's house, kind of like uh, she loved for preachers and missionaries to stay there. And uh, she'd look you over and if you needed new shoes or a new suit or something, she'd buy it. And, when my wife and I moved over 1,500 miles from there to this area, she had a son in the Ozark Christian College, a grandson in the Ozark Christian College, and she came to our home, which is very difficult to find, and left us three jars of jam and jelly <laughs> in the front door. We weren't there. But God bless you women, uh, women like Lydia, who are making the cause of Christ uh, grow rapidly because of your faith and faithfulness and generosity. So Paul had this warm feeling. Now when he wrote to the Galatians and to other congregations, he stated his credentials. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not by men nor by man, but by the will of God and so forth. He doesn't do any of that. These are, these are his friends. So he said, hey, Timothy's with me. And the word servant, what's another word for servant? That's true, the, the word diakonos, but this is not that word. That's the word that's used uh, a little later uh, in uh, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at, uh, at Philippi together with the overseer and deacon. That's diakonos. This is the word doulos. Forgive me if that's too technical, but that's the word for slave. And uh, a very humbling position. Remember Jesus washed the disciples' feet. The elders of the Gentiles try to be big shots and lord it over one another, but it shall not be so among you. He that's the greatest among you will be your slave. He'll be your servant. So it's, anyhow, Paul repeatedly referred in, in this way. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers, and the deacons. Now, the, uh, the government of the early church had overseers and deacons. In Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul was on his way to Jerusalem and he really didn't have time to visit Ephesus, but he stopped at Miletus and he called for the elders of the church at Ephesus to come and meet him there. This is Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, and then he began speaking and teaching them. 
In verse 28 it said, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. So we have three words used to describe the function of an overseer. Another word is bishop. The King James uses that. If any man desireth the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. But elders, bishops, or pastors all refer to one in the same function that was performed in the early church. And when the apostles didn't want to take time away from the teaching of the word, they were too busy to feed tables or serve tables, they appointed six men to do that and they were assumed to be the first deacons because that's the word used to describe their service. Then in the 14th chapter of the book of Acts in verse 23, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them for the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So we have a, a window of insight into the government of the church there in uh, we read it a moment ago in chapter 4. No other church had fellowship with me concerning giving and receiving, but you won't. So there was a church at Philippi, and the church had overseers, elders, or bishops, and they were the pastors of the church. And then they had the deacons, and the qualifications for these two functions are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Verse 2, Grace and peace to you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where was Paul when he was writing this letter? He was in Rome. Prison. In prison. And uh, how neat or how godly, how thoughtful that he's concerned about them. Not about grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The word partnership, this is the word koinonia. There's a campus ministry at our local college called koinonia. It's the Bible word for fellowship or partnership. The early church con continued steadfastly in four things. Anybody remember what they were? Acts 2.42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. So this idea of a partnership, a fellowship, uh, if you're in partnership, truly in partnership with somebody, and they need help, you help them go to the bank get the money or you stop by and uh, take your coat off and and start working but the he did it with joy now the word for joy in the Greek language is kara it occurs five times in this letter the verb is karine which occurs eleven times now again he is a, he's chained to a soldier 24 hours a day but he's happy uh, the joy of the Lord was his strength the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. So uh, what a tremendous tonic or encouragement it is that he had this joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy and I want to point out uh, something that now seems so obvious to me. I, I wonder why I didn't see it many years ago. In uh, Jeremiah, oh man, I'm having a senior moment here. Um, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What is that? Jeremiah 21.9. At any rate, that's what it says. The heart of man is 
deceitful and desperately wicked. Well, I don't think your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked at all. Because the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Ezekiel 36, 25, Ezekiel said, I'm going to take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. <coughs> so the unconverted person has got a deceitful and desperately wicked heart <coughs> and you can predict they're going to get into trouble. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, I didn't give you the verse, but in Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning with verse 24, after Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from the beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. And that's something the law was not given to save us. It was an accuser. It was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty. So it's going to be a witness against you for I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are if you have been rebellious against the Lord while I am still alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? Did that happen or not? Yeah. He said, you, you guys, you messed up while I was on the mountain, you were fornicating before a golden calf. And when I die, you're going to be worse. In fact, because you're going to do so many bad things, the Lord's going to scatter you throughout the whole earth because of your sin. Now I want you to contrast this with what we just read in the first chapter of the book of Philippians. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So to the unconverted person, if you're going to bet on anything, bet they're going to sin and they're going to continue to sin. And if they give themselves to Jesus Christ and are born again, and they have the Holy Spirit living within them, they're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. But this is a pivotal truth that... Uh, it, it's wonderful to be a Christian. And for those who are in Christ, there is always optimism. Verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains, which he was, defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Now he's writing to people who had just sent him some money, who had sent him money twice when he was in Thessalonica. They had continued to pray for him. They didn't have the opportunity to send him money all the time because they didn't know where he was. But when they did know where he was and they did know he had needs, they sent to help it. And we'll read later that one of the messengers, it's actually a word for apostle, somebody sent by the church, a guy named Epaphroditus, he came with a love offering for Paul. Verse 8. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Uh, someone said, if you know, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And sometimes it's hard to tell what you decide and what the Holy Spirit within you decides. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So, well, I decided to come to prayer meeting. Well, did you decide that or did the Holy Spirit? Did Jesus decide that? So anyhow, he, he had uh, this confirmation that the affection, the love of Christ Jesus was being manifest through him to these people. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight one of the things about a seed is that it starts growing down as well as up and if you don't have a roots root system you don't have fruits no roots no fruit and the deeper we are in Christ the more love we have 
One of my favorite passages is in Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that it would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So he says, and this is my prayer, that your love, may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. List of things that happened <coughs> to the Apostle Paul. He's writing to people that he knew and loved, kind of like family members. They knew what happened to him <coughs> when he was in Philippi. That's when he got beaten up, thrown in jail, and had this set to with, or this con uh, disagreement with the leaders of the city, and had to leave and go down to Thessalonica and Berea. They knew that. So that's your first paragraph. He had, on the third missionary journey, he had been receiving money for the poor saints in Judea. There was a great famine that took place in Judea, and it was decided by the Jerusalem Council that the people in the Gentile world would contribute money for the poor saints in Judea. Now the famine was throughout the whole world. Why would the Jews in Judea have more problem with the famine than other people? What do you think? They did have more trouble. My question is why? What happens in a time of famine? Prices will go up or down? They go up. It's a supply and demand. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> in a famine in Samaria, why they were selling a donkey's head for a whole bunch of money and the fourth part of a cab of doves dung. You know, man, it, it was very, very expensive. Did the Jews in Jerusalem have a lot of money? Leroy, why didn't they have a lot of money? You're right, they didn't. More sure. Gentiles than Jews. Beg pardon? More Gentiles than Jews. Well, uh, that may be true, but no, I, I think, remember back on the day of Pentecost when all of these people became Christians and they had been, they were Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. Then it lists 17 nationalities, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and they stayed there from Passover to Pentecost and they hadn't been to work for weeks. And so how did they eat? Don't you remember? As many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Barnabas was from Cyprus. He had beast ground. He sold it, and everybody got so excited they changed his name to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And then Ananias and Sapphira thought, boy, they're bragging on Barnabas. We're going to get in on this. So they came, brought a little money and said, oh yeah, we're well, just a spiritual Barnabas. We sold it all and here's the money. <laughs> that was not good. They both died because they had lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter said, well, you had the money. It was yours. You didn't have to give it. It was yours. You haven't lied to men, you've lied to God. But the point is, 
that they had bankrupted themselves feeding their brothers from all over the world. As many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them. And they brought the price of the things that were sold. And again, at the risk of getting off on a tangent, not everybody sold their houses because we read in Acts chapter 12 that Mary, the mother of John Mark, had a house. They were praying. They had a servant girl named Rhoda. Uh, so we don't want to be legalistic, but it's kind of good like my friend that owned this airplane said, it's not my airplane, it's the Lord's airplane. I, that is, my name's on the title. But it really isn't mine, it belongs to God. And so, whatever the Lord wants to use it for, that's cool with me. So Mary, the mother of John Mark, said her house, we know, I could sell the house, but we're using it. I think that's where they met in the upper room. 120 of them met in the upper room. I think that's where they had the Last Supper. So it was a central meeting place for a lot of believers. And she would, I think, been glad to sell it if that would have been beneficial for the kingdom. But it was more beneficial for her to keep that house because it was a place where the brethren could meet. All right, now, here are some of the things that happened as Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem with money for the poor saints. And I've got these bullet points. Uh, on his way to Jerusalem, the money for the poor saints, the Holy Spirit warned Paul in every city that he was facing imprisonment and hardships. Next bullet point. At Tyre, now that was at Miletus, at Tyre, miles away, a certain, disi this certain disciples urged Paul through the Spirit, don't go up to Jerusalem. They had received the same message that Paul had received in every city. When you get to Jerusalem, you're going to be tortured and put in prison. Don't do it! Now, I don't think the Holy Spirit inspired them to say don't go. The Holy Spirit told them what was going to happen, and then they assumed he shouldn't go. Then a prophet named Agabus at Caesarea predicted, he took a belt and bound himself and said, yeah, uh, Paul, the man who owns this belt, is going to be girded and handed over to the Gentiles. The Jews are going to do it. Then these brethren also pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Don't do it! You're going to jail down there. Paul insisted, however. What do you mean? Talk like this. I'm not only ready to go to prison, I'm ready to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. And they said, all right. The will of the Lord be done. That's the bullseye. It's not my will, but thine be done. So Paul goes into Jerusalem and he meets with the elders and they say, you see how many thousands of the Jews there are that believe they're all zealous of the law and they've heard that you're teaching people to apostatize from Moses. We know that isn't true. But in order to pacify these believers, we want we got four men who have a vow. We want you to pay money for them. Purify yourself, go into, and Paul, all right, I'll, I'll do it, whatever. To the Jew, I become a Jew that I might gain the Jew. To the Greek, I become a Greek that I might gain the Greek. I become all things to all men that by all means I might win some. I'll do it. So he does this, and then some Jews from Asia. Now, when Paul was in Ephesus for three years, the Demetrius and the silversmiths, we're going out of business and they got so mad they had a riot and they just start screaming, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great! And so uh, they had a Jew there and uh, man alive, they hated him. And uh, so the Jewish people, they didn't like Paul at all and they had some hard feelings that had uh, been a part of their thinking for years since his time in Ephesus. So they just told a lie and they said, he's taking Greeks into the temple. And there was a middle wall of partition that divided the place where the Jews worshipped and the place where the Greeks were allowed. And uh, the Jews had the right to kill somebody that went in the room. If you were a Gentile and you went into the Jewish section, the Jews could kill you. And they accused Paul of it. He hadn't done it. But they accused him. Then the Jews tried to kill him. But the Roman soldiers, and again, the Roman soldiers were very 
uh, cautious, not too long before, 165 years before, the Jewish people had revolted against the Syrian government and won their independence. And they knew that the Jews were like a tinderbox that uh, you could have a revolution at any time. So here was the Jewish temple and right next to the Jewish temple was a Roman fortress called the Tower of Antonia. And that's where the Roman soldiers were garrisoned and they could look right down at the temple. Anything going wrong, they'd go down there and kill a bunch of people. It, Jesus referred to that, that uh, the blood of worshipers that uh, were, they went there to kill lambs and the Roman soldiers came in and killed them because they were about to revolt. So at any rate, uh, the Roman soldiers, when they saw this commotion, they go down there and because Paul is being attacked, they assume he's the, the reason why everybody's so mad and so they place him under arrest and as they're taking him off to prison he speaks in the Greek language to this captain he said well let me talk to these people he said, well, can you speak Greek I thought you were an Egyptian no no he said I'm a Jew I was born in Tarsus in Cilicia okay so he turned around and he preaches a sermon which is recorded in the 22nd chapter of the book of Acts and he concluded the sermon by saying the Lord sent him to the Gentiles and when he said this the Jews stopped their ears they threw dust in the air and said away with this man he's not fit to live now we're talking about Philippians 1.12 what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel now how's that going to advance the gospel well it did so he uh, uh, he was tried before Governor Felix and even though no charges against him were proved Felix kept him in prison for two years hoping to receive a bribe somebody said why did this Paul come to Jerusalem oh he had a bunch of money he had been going all over the world collecting money and he's giving it to poor people here in Jerusalem oh he's got a lot of money now oh yeah he's got a lot of money well <laughs> I'll just let him twist in the wind for a while and maybe he'll come up with something to grease my palm or a bribe for me. Uh, well, that didn't happen. Two years later, a new governor named Portius Festus, he comes into power and he wants to please the Jews and he said, well, why, uh, what do you Jews want? He said, we want to bring Paul back to Jerusalem for trial. He's a troublemaker. And there have been above 40 men, as I pointed out, that uh, didn't want to eat or drink till they'd killed him. And Paul said, you're not turning me over to those guys. I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Rome. And he said, okay, uh, you've got that right. And then he, he, uh, he didn't know what to charge him. He had kept him for over two years, didn't even have him charged with it. So he said, man, now I'm in a jam because I'm a new governor and I'm sending this prisoner to Rome and I don't even have a charge. So he called Festus, um, called Agrippa and Bernice, who were experts in Jewish law, and said, help me out. we got to find out a charge to send to this guy. And so they have a trial and Paul preaches to them and they say, well, if you hadn't have appealed to Rome, we let him go. Now, if you're second guessing, looking over your shoulders, oh no, oh no, did I do something wrong? No, Paul didn't do anything wrong. Remember, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Even this. So, he's put on a ship with a centurion. Every time we read about a centurion in the Bible, it seems like they're good and decent people. Well, I'm going to just mention a couple of things, and I think, God willing, next Wednesday we'll begin, we'll kind of review this, because he gets on this ship, and he tries to warn them, don't sail, it's too dangerous, and the centurion, ah, oh, this isn't a very good place to spend the winter, and the owner and the pilot of the ship, he's next, he knows what he's talking about. Paul said, well, you're going to be sorry, and they were. They were two weeks in a storm, they threw the cargo overboard. Uh, they didn't lose any lives, but they didn't see the sun or the moon or the stars for two weeks, didn't eat anything. 
Man, it's a rough time, and then they got shipwrecked, and when they got off the ship and Paul was helping to build a fire, what happened? He got bitten by a deadly snake. And uh, if you're wanting to complain, here's a pretty good list to start with. Yeah, everything's going wrong. <laughs> I'm trying to do right. I'm taking this, and they're they're putting me in jail, and they're beating me up, and they're trying to kill me, and they're lying about me, and everything's going. On. No, no, no. Rejoice in the Lord. I'm writing you with joy. I want you to know that the, everything has happened to me. God has turned into something good. Everything. Romans eight twenty eight. Everything is working together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose, what's been happening to you? And if you are a child of God, it's going to turn out to be something good. 